the ranks of scripture rather than the robes of reason. God and author. That's Harmon's bold assertion at the beginning of his London writings. The triune God is an author. In fact, he is the only true author. The Father is the author of the world that he has created and its story. The Son is the author of the church that he has redeemed and its story. The Spirit is the author of the scriptures that he has inspired and his story. Yet the word that has been authored by the Spirit is by far the greatest, claims Hank Harmon, is by far the greatest of all these wonders for the word of the Spirit discloses the mysteries of creation and redemption. It is the mystery of all mysteries. The, the Bible, the Scriptures, as the word of the Spirit. That's his great theme in the London writings. And that's where I want to start in this introduction to him and his London writings today. You know, I must admit to you that I am sorely tempted to start elsewhere, as most scholars do. I could join John Betts in his wonderful book, After Enlightenment, The Post-Secular Vision of Johann Gabriel Hartmann, by far his best English interpreter, by commending him to you, just listen to this, I quote, as probably the most interesting and radical thinker in the ranks, the ranks of Lutheran orthodoxy <laughs> has produced. He's arguably one of the greatest, most prophetically, and ironically, most forgotten. Christian authors of modernity, the Irenaeus of his time. <coughs> wow, that's high praise. <laughs> and coming up from outside the Lutheran church, he's a Catholic, by the way, Roman Catholic. <laughs> I could also present him to you quite justifiably, as he himself did. Um, uh, as an author who wanted to recognize no other orthodoxy than the Lutheran small catechism. And he repeats that again and again in his life. And then in this present context, oh, it's getting at me. In this present context, I would even introduce him to you as uh, C.F.W. Valdai did in 1862, before an excerpt from Thoughts on the Course of My Life, uh, that's, we'll hear more about that shortly, in Lera and Vera, uh, that's in 1862, as one of the few highly gifted writers of the German na uh, nation in recent time who had a sincere faith in the scriptures. So he knew him, and he knew him well. Yet no matter how much I'm tempted to start with praise for him as a spiritually enlightened author, that emphasis would not do justice to him and his unique contribution as a lay theologian par excellence. He was in fact not a professional theologian, but a humble employee in the Prussian bureaucracy that he hated. Um, and just by the way, a man of letters, a journalist. Um, but if I emphasized him, uh, 
I would misrepresent him to you for two reasons. On the one hand, he never published the London writings, nor did he intend them to be published. They were for himself. Apart from the account of his so-called conversion um, in his thoughts on the course of my life, which he shared with his father, brother, and two best um, uh, well-educated friends, they were written for himself personally as a kind of, we would call it probably a spiritual journal these days. So he never intended them to be published. They were not for the public domain. On the other hand, <coughs> the London writer, in the London writings, he writes as an astonished reader of the story written by God's spirit rather than human authors. Or rather, the reader of God's stories, the story of Israel and Jesus in the Bible, the story of the world, and the story of his own life as a reader of the Bible. These, he emphasizes, are in fact not three separate stories, but in a mir miraculous way, a single story with one divine author. And since that story tells of God's threefold condescension in creation, redemption, and inspiration, it requires a reader with the right mentality, the right receptive disposition. So says Harmon, a humble heart is the only proper frame of mind for reading the Bible and the essential preparation for doing that. The condescension of the spirit in the inspiration of the Bible. That's what I want to focus on. We then have God, and particularly the Holy Spirit, as the author, and Harmon as the reader. Couldn't have anything more simple than that. But wow, what a mystery. By becoming a reader, a receptive reader of this one book, this bookworm, this critical reader of many books, discovers that in reading the Bible, he himself is read and critiqued and understood, as he himself has never understood himself. So, uh, that's the theme. God as author, Harmon as reader. A reader who is read by the author. I must confess that I have a special interest in his London writings and in Harmon as a Lutheran thinker. He's been a spiritual, theological mentor for me since I encountered him, first of all, in the study of German literature at the University in Adelaide, and then as a student of theology in the seminary, where I stumbled upon him, because I never realized when I was at university that he was a Christian, let alone a Lutheran. And I've just completed the English translation of his London writings, which will be published later this year, God willing, by Ballast Press. These writings have, in fact, been published in German as a single critical volume only recently in 1993. Just imagine, uh, 200 years almost after he's written by Osmond Barr and uh, Weissenborn. Uh, Up to now, only parts of these London writings have been translated in English. 
even though they lay the intellectual and theological foundation for his all his published works, the things that he wrote to be published, um, uh, which make good sense only in their light. And his published works are puzzling, mysterious, dense, difficult, uh, and deliberately so, and can only be understood in the light of what, what he has to say in the London writings. Well, this English translation may be of some interest to academic scholars. It should be even more useful to us, his largely unacknowledged heirs. We can, I hope, learn much from his Lutheran vision of God's enlightening glory and our utter ignorance. Hidden as both are under, or as in Latin, so contrario, everybody's quoting Latin, so I'll do it too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hidden under the opposite. Yeah. Hidden under the opposite. Uh, theology of the cross. Um, he is one of the few theologians of the cross in his day, and between Luther and I don't know who. I'll leave that to you, historians. So in this paper, I want to introduce Luhrmann and his London writings to you by examining their origin, their contents, and their nature. Even though it will be all too brief, like trying to give you a sense of the ocean in a teacup, I hope to arouse your interest in them so that you may perhaps even read my translation of them. And if you think I'm uh, blowing them up too big, Gene Beef is here and he's editing them and he's uh, uh, become an enthusiast for them. So, First of all, the origin of the London writings. Johann Gail Kartmann lived from 1730 to 1788 um, and spent most of his life in the city of Königsberg, the German-speaking administrative and academic centre in East Prussia. That's at the southeast corner of the Baltic Sea strategic location where the Russians always threaten. Born to parents of modest means, his father was a surgeon, but not terribly wealthy. He had a rather conventional Lutheran upbringing with a father who was still largely orthodox in orientation and a mother who was much more influenced by Lutheran pietism. He studied theology and then switched over to law in the local university where Kant and other eminent uh, uh, scholars were teaching, where he became a fashionable advocate of the environment with his two best friends. They were the campus intellectuals uh, of their day. He admits that his interests, however, lay elsewhere than in the study of theology and law. What took away my taste for theology, he says, and all serious subject was a new inclination that awoke in me for antiquities, that's history, <coughs> for criticism, for the fine decorative arts as well, for poetry, novels, philology, okay, for French authors and their talent for writing, painting, portraying, and pleasing the imagination. <coughs> Notice imagination. Due to his haphazard and uh, uh, desultory attendance of classes, his pursuit of extra curricular activities, were, which were his main concern, and a speech impediment 
that precluded a career as a pastor or as a lawyer, he failed to graduate. Yet all the time, he kept on reading widely, voraciously. Um, by the end of his life, he was in fact regarded as one of the best read men of his generation. After employment as a tutor for two German families from 1752, to 1756 in what is now Latvia, he was employed in Riga, the present capital of Latvia, as a secretary of a merchant firm owned by the family of his best friend, Christoph Bavans. And they sent him on a, sent him on a trade mission to London to negotiate a secret trade deal for the firm between Russia and England. Now, this was secret and we don't know the details of it, um, but there's some funny business going on there. When that fell into a, in a heap, he lived rather dissolutely. Um, so he was there from April 15, uh, 1757, so it fell in heat fairly soon, and he fell into bad company, including a circle of homosexuals on the fringes of the nobility, part of fashionable society, and he got lost. He, he got deep into debt because he was a generous person, a soft touch. Um, so he thought they were favouring him, but in fact they were milking him financially um, and uh, uh, lost all his money. Lost and lonely, he suffered ill health from overindulgence and experienced a deep bout of depression from social isolation. He was a gregarious person who only felt comfortable in the company of like minds, isolated. Then befriended by a devout young Christian couple who provided cheap accommodation for him early in 1758, he went into seclusion and lived on porridge which did him the world of good, he says. <laughs> I can't imagine why. <laughs> I hate God. <laughs> he first then, in his seclusion, he first then began to read some of the many books that he wasted his money on and found no consolation at all in them. <laughs> on, him, on, impulse, on impulse, he went out and bought an English Bible and began reading it on March the 13th, 1758. <laughs> now, dates are very important for Hannah. It had little impact on him for the first six days when he read it day and night, just continuously. <coughs> and as he read from the cover, he became aware of the veil over his reason and heart that had closed the book to him. He became aware that there was something there that he wasn't getting. He became aware of his ignorance. He expected to read it and to say, yes, I know, yes, I know all about this, but he became aware of his ignorance. And then on Palm Sunday, 1758, it struck him for the first time that God was speaking to him personally as he was reading it. And he switched over. He no longer read it critically, analytically, but meditated on it, particularly as it critiqued him and his rationalism. Mm. On, um, on the day that he began to read the Bible for the second time, in a new way, that's as God speaking to him, 
he began to write down the results of his meditations in a kind of spiritual journal that he called the Biblical Meditations of a Christian. That's the heart of the book, right? And then on Friday evening, March the 31st, in the week of Easter, he fell into a deep reverie as he was reading Deuteronomy chapter 5 with its report of the Israelites, and that the Israelites heard God speaking to them face to face, directly speaking the Decalogue to them at Mount Sinai, which was so terrifying that they asked God to provide Moses as the mediator of his word. And then it happened. Here is, he, here is how he described what happened to him on that evening. He says, I recognize my own offenses in the history of the Jewish people. I read the story of my own life and thank God for his forbearance with his, his people. Because nothing but such an example could justify a similar hope for me. Then in the midst of these reflections, which seem rather mysterious to me, I read the fifth chapter of the fifth book of Moses, that's Deuteronomy, on the evening of the 31st of March, and fell into deep meditation. <coughs> Probably triggered by the uh, 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 commandment, um, I thought about Abel and God's word to him, which is, the earth has opened up its mouth to receive your brother's blood. Your brother's blood. I felt my heart thump. I heard a voice groaning and wailing in its ears. <laughs> like the voice of blood, like the voice of a murdered brother who wanted to avenge his blood. If I at times didn't hear it and would continue to shut my ears to it. It said that this was what made Cain restless and unable to escape. At once I felt my heart flowing it poured itself out in tears and I could no longer, I could no longer hide from God that I was the killer of my brother, the murderer of his only begotten son. Despite my great weakness, despite the long resistance which I had until now put up against his witness and his tender touch, the Spirit of God kept on revealing to me still more and more the mystery of divine love and the benefit of faith in our gracious only Savior. <clears throat> At that momentous upheaval, that dramatic awakening, Harmon was convicted of two things his own sin of fratricide, killing his brother, Jesus, and God's grace for him as the murderer of his son. Then, in his broken heart, he heard how the blood of Jesus, which called out to God for vengeance, was also proclaiming God's grace and love to him. And that word broke his blind, hard, rocky, misguided, stubborn heart. And he surrendered to God. He surrendered it to God for recreation by his Holy Spirit. He says, God poured him out from one vessel into another. Got a marvelous imagination, um, apt metaphor. 
In another place, he gives us this summary of what he experienced that momentous evening. He says, when we get to know ourselves, when we come to see ourselves almost as we really are, how we wish, plead, fear for ourselves. How we then feel the need for all that God, without knowing, without us knowing it, being interested in it, or even asking for any of it, has never grown tired of presenting to us, offering to us, encouraging and even frightening us to receive. <coughs> then we hear the blood of the Redeemer crying out in our heart. We feel the bottom of it has been sprinkled with the blood that was shed for the reconciliation of the whole world. We feel that the blood of vengeance cries out for grace on our behalf. It's quite apt that we hear this in a symposium where we've been talking about this right now. After that event, and it was a momentous event that cut his life in half. Uh, after that event, he continued to read the Bible and record the fruit of his meditations. As he does so, the tone of it gradually changes. The comments are less abstract, intellectual, perhaps even theological, and more personal and devotional. And then we, when he completed uh, uh, the composition of biblical meditation, that's a big work, a uh, huge thing, which he wrote in a frenzy in a very short space of time, he then uh, wrote his uh, biographical sketch, Thoughts on the Course of My Life, from 21st to 25th of April, April followed by Meditations on Church Hymns, from the 29th of April to the 6th of May, and six other pieces that I'll mention later on, before he set out uh, for Riga and returned home on June the 27th. It was in London, 13 months, arriving in April, leaving in June the following year. And it was there in Riga that he added some further thoughts on the course of his life, and a personal prayer of supplication and intercession for his own devotional use. Thus the London writings were written over the space of basically six months around what was the turning point of his life. They made his amazing transformation from an ardent rationalist an ardent advocate of the Enlightenment, passionately so, to a rather unlikely champion of classical Lutheranism, which was in his day about as unfashionable as you could get it, even more unfashionable than now. They document his transition from unenlightened rationalism, that's his own term, uh, to enlighten faith in Jesus, the Alpha and Omega, the be all and end all of his life. Right now, for the next part, you can please just have in front of you the hand up that I made available to you. Um, because the contents which I outline, the contents of the language. <coughs> The London writings are a series of separate texts that differ greatly in character and length. They are all personal in their origin and are all in some way the product of deep reflection, meditation on the Bible. Now that's the uniting ticket. They all arise out of meditation on the Word of God, the Word of the Spirit. Since they were never meant for publication, they are quite polished in some places, um, unfinished, um, 
in others, and generally rather rough. It's that they are a first draft that he never went back to. There are in all nine compositions, most of which are clearly dated. And that's significant because they mark a sequence of time, and I'll come back to that. The London writings begin with an amazing little summary, and nobody can do summaries as well as Hartman, amazing summary on the interpretation of sacred scripture. And I've printed that wholly for you uh, to give you a sample. I'm not going to read it now. That's for your use um, to come back to it because it doesn't make for a quick summary reading. Here in the, this summary, Harmon doesn't set out a hermeneutic, a set of principles for the cognitive appropriation of the scriptures, but graphically explains why a humble heart is the only proper frame of mind uh, for reading the Bible. The Bible, which is even more in misinterpreted by its philosophical critics, this, the early historical critical critics of his day, then Aesop's fables about animals would be if they were able to read them. Boy, well, it's a devastating week. Do you get that? Um, Aesop's fables, that stories about um, um, moralistic stories about animals. He said if, if, if animals could read, um, they would make better sense of Aesop's fables than these enlightened philosophers make of the Bible. A humble heart alone does justice <coughs> to its miraculous inspiration by the condescending spirit and the spirit's paradoxical revelation of God's wisdom and power through what seems to be foolish and weak. Echo of First Corinthians <coughs> 2, no, uh, chapter 1. The word of the spirit and that's his, one of his favorite terms, the word of the Spirit, or the Bible, is an unlike, unlikely means of grace. Like the rags that were used to rescue Jeremiah from his muddy prison. Like the pool of water with the spittle and dust that Jesus used to give sight to the blind man. So the way the Spirit uses unlikely things, rags, spit, dust, water, <coughs> means of the Spirit. What the Scriptures have to say for our salvation and enlightenment, notice that the two things, salvation of Jeremiah, the enlightenment of the blind man, <coughs> appears to us to be just as stupid um, as to us as unbelievers, to be just as stupid as the plain madness and scribblings of David, the fugitive from Saul in the court of Achish, the fat Philistine king. Madness, insanity, stupidity. But that's the way the Spirit reveals the mysteries of God. Then after this comes uh, the main part of the London writings, Biblical Meditations on the Scripture of a Christian, from the 15th of March to the 21st of April, uh, 1758. Here we have the heart and soul of the London writings. They come first of all, uh, that introduction is undated, so it's kind of separate. Um, this is the beginning of the dated sequence. They come first because God's word came first for Harmon from this time on in his life. And his meditation on God's word brought about his spiritual awakening and transformation from a rational intellectual to a faithful confessor of the triune God. Now I've been 
of deliberately avoiding the term conversion for this experience of Hatman because he was a Christian, he was a believer before this experience. It's much more his awakening than his conversion. Even though the pietists picked him up and used him as a sample um, for uh, conversion. The original title of this work was The Journal of a Christian, um, but he changes it to The Biblical Meditations of the Script of a Christian uh, to shift attention away from himself, his subjective experience, to the Bible, the cause of that transformation. He called, he uses the German word uh, Betrachtungen, um, which is uh, contemplations uh, to emphasize his visionary engagement uh, with the Bible, or rather its visionary impact on him and his imagination as he meditated on it. Again and again, where uh, 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 you would expect him to say, here we discover, here we know what, he says here we see. So the emphasis is on seeing. He didn't meditate on the Bible analytically and cognitively to further his knowledge of its content, but devotionally and <coughs> contemplatively to see what God was saying to him as he read it. One of his famous dictates is Speak to me that I may see you. How do we see another person? Not with our eyes, but with our ears. He read it in order to be enlightened by the Holy Spirit and gain insights into God's dealings with him and all people. Now, once it's understood, that he doesn't seek to interpret the text exegetically, this is no exegetical exercise, we can make sense of its unsystematic, haphazard character with his attention to what appear to be insignificant texts. Not the kind of thing that seem to be totally unimportant and that you overlook. Uh, for him, the insignificant is significant. And also his apparent neglect of what are the big passages, the significant passages. As he reads, he meditates on those parts that address him personally, or rather that speak to him intellectually, or critique him intellectually as a child of the enlightened. They identify his blind spots, his spiritual and therefore intellectual blind spots, in order to grant him deeper, more accurate insight into the spiritual realities that they portray. And what's interesting is that uh, his focus is basically on the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, um, it's not where we might suppose if it's not on the prophets or the Psalms, uh, uh, but on the Pentateuch, because that's the part that was most offensive to the, in, its enlightened critics of his day and our day. And it's interesting that he begins this, uh, uh, the uh, meditations, the biblical meditations of a Christian, with a brilliant meditation on the inspiration of the Bible by the Holy Spirit and the nature of God's revelation uh, uh, to men, through men, in order to address human beings in their own terms of reference. How God translates the language of angels into the language of men, not sophisticated, ordinary men, but the simplest and humblest of all men. How God speaks in human idiom 
rather than in the Bible. Hence his emphasis is on the condescension of the Spirit and the way God accommodates and the Spirit accommodates himself to our limitations. Um, some amazing uh, insights and one of the best uh, treatments that I know on the inspiration of the scripture. And if I can do a little bit of an aside here, you know, some, uh, uh, in, in over the last hundred years, the church, uh, and particularly uh, the Lutheran church, the conservative part of the Lutheran church, has emphasized the inspiration of the Bible. And rightly so, that it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. Um, and, but that's only half the story, Armand claims. The Bible was inspired by the Holy Spirit so that the words of the Bible can be the means by which the Spirit inspires us. That's why it's inspired. Then the third uh, document is Thoughts on the Course of My Life. Um, written over the space of, I suppose, about four days, 21st to 25th of April. Now, like the Confessions of Augustine, which they are modelled on in some way, this best-known work of Harman relates the circumstances of his so-called conversion. It is his personal confession addressed to God and himself that begins and ends with prayer. Now that's significant. It's coram dato, it's in the presence of God and uh, his own, in his own conscience. It begins and ends with prayer to God the Father. And in it, he engages in three kinds of confession. The confession of his sins, the confession of thanksgiving, for God's saving word and his confession of faith in the triune God. So, uh, praise, confession of sins, and faith. And his confession of faith in the triune God is uh, quite unusual for his day and until recent times quite, no, totally Trinitarian. Uh, he confesses faith in God the Father for the revelation of himself to humanity. In Jesus, for his incarnation to needy people as a needy man. And here is the accent in this, and his confession of faith in the Holy Spirit for foolishly providing a book for us proud people as his word in seemingly trivial, contemptible events that tell us the story of heaven and earth. And God's got no taste whatsoever for the Holy Spirit. He's tasteless. And that, by the way, was one of the criticisms of the life. And it's still um, not quite what I've often articulated and was touched on um, on Tuesday in connection with the, the but that, that whole bloody business, much of the distaste of people um, is, has to do with, uh, um, it just is, it violates our sense of what's uh, tasteful. Now, the most significant <coughs> and overlooked feature of this confession is its concentration on God's word rather than his own spiritual awakening. And in that way, it differs from the whole genre of confessions that, that, that were already around in this day and followed then in the 19th century to the uh, uh, 20th century. Confessions which focus on experience rather than the Word of God. Then, number four, comes a series of um, meditations called Thoughts on Church Hymns from 29th of April to 6th of May. Here Harmon meditates devotionally on six hymns which all consider 
the hidden glory of Christians. Theology of the cross, the hiddenness of God in Jesus corresponds with the hiddenness of our glory as Christians. The hidden glory of Christians who have been made in God's image to, to participate in the communion of the Son with the Father by the Holy Spirit. To share in the divine life of the Holy Trinity and the glory of Jesus already now in this life. The centerpiece of these meditations, six hymns, is a reflection on Christ's exaltation, his ascension, on ascension day. That's in the middle of this. In um, his meditation on ascension day, he notes that God's son became a son of man and an heir of its curse and death and fate so that a man would become a son of God, an only heir of heaven, as closely united with God as the fullness of deity dwelt bodily in Christ. By his kenosis, his self-emptying, we believers have theosis, divinization, uh, better we share in the divine nature. Since by faith we share in his divine nature. Um, uh, that emphasis on theosis, which has been re emphasized by the Finnish theologians, um, uh, uh, which was one of the great themes of Lutheran orthodoxy with its teaching on the mystical union, the sacramental union. Um, is very, very prominent in uh, Harman's thinking at a time when it was rejected uh, by almost everybody around him. Harman therefore exclaims in amazement at this great exchange, how human, how weak and lowly God makes himself on our account, how small he makes himself, how proud he makes a human being. He himself became a man to make us gods. He gives us all that he has. What could be dearer than his Son and his Holy Spirit? All that God has is mine. He's quoting from a hymn there. All that God has is mine. And what was the purpose of that? He says, my son, give me your heart. He concludes with this um, description of the mystical union, the sacramental union, probably is, is, is more, it's more accurate. <laughs> this true union with God is a foretaste of heaven. It is heaven itself. <coughs> it is the last rung on the ladder which unites earth as the footstool with God's throne. This participation in the divine nature is the final goal of God's incarnation. They are both equally great mysteries which are nevertheless prefigured by human nature and its parts. Here he's referring to the strange union of human beings as body and soul, or body and spirit. Uh, this prefigures that uh, union. Um, participation in divine nature by virtue of the incarnation of our Lord. Number five, if you follow your hand out there, um, is a meditation on Deuteronomy 24 to 10, together with Romans 10, to ten. This has to do with the, the, the passage where God, where uh, God says through Moses to His people, "The word of God is not far from you. It's not up to heaven that you've got to go, get get a ladder to go there. You don't have to go down to hell, the underworld, to bring it up there. It's in your very heart. Uh, the word, and then Paul picks it up in uh, Romans ten. Um, while these 
undated reflections on the correlation between God's creative word and receptive faith may be regarded as a separate document. They are best regarded as an appendix to the previous meditations on church hymns because they conclude with the verse from a well-known hymn. Now let's, I commend this to you because there's something very interesting here uh, that he touches on, which I'm not aware anybody else has noted. When I was in Cambridge doing my doctorate some years ago, an age ago, um, the whole academic world, and particularly the science departments and the physics department, was agog uh, with, uh, because of the, uh, uh, yeah, um, it wasn't the, the discovery, but uh, it, it had become, um, uh, now, people were <coughs> somewhere expounding what, what's now called the anthropic principle. I don't know if you know it. I'm not a physicist, but basically it's this. The whole universe is an intricate, amazing order. Mm -hmm. um, and if you just take everything to do with the Earth, the tilting of its axis, etc., Everything is so finely calibrated that if it goes a little bit this way or that way, um, it would cease to exist. And more importantly, for purposes, that uh, it was calibrated in this way to make life on Earth possible and human life possible. So the anthropic principle is that the whole of the world and the whole of the universe is calibrated to support life on planet Earth. Now, he doesn't refer to that, but he said that uh, comments on the correspondence between the divine word of God and the human heart, how they correspond with each other. It's a very subtle, careful argument, uh, which I come to you. Then number six, we have fragments. Um, this is the most philosophical of all the London writings. Here, Harman reflects on our human dependence on the five senses that we have. Hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, touching. And he compares the five senses to the five loaves that Jesus uh, used to feed the 5,000 in John chapter 6. Um, but Jesus performed, and so much so that there were 12 baskets left over after the feeding. And he says that um, apart from the senses and their illumination by the Holy Spirit, both reason and faith are blind. Now, uh, there's a lot going on here. Um, apart from the senses, reason is blind, it can't see. Um, apart from the senses, and therefore God's revelation to us in the terms of our five senses, faith is blind. So the incarnation and the whole scientific enterprise depend on the senses. Our knowledge is therefore limited and partial. So, for example, we can't even know ourselves apart from God and our neighbour. Only through Jesus as our neighbour, as our human neighbour, accessible to us in our five senses, can we get to know ourselves and God. But that only partially, as we are known by God. He concludes, and you need to know that he's speaking against the philosophers of his age who explain everything in their marvellous systems. Think Kant, think Hegel. Um, he concludes, here we live on scraps. Our thoughts are nothing but fragments. Yes, our knowledge is patchwork. We only ever see part of the story. The number seven, 
we have meditations on Newton's study on prophecies. This is Newton, theologian, not Newton, great physicist. In these observations, Harman notes that the Old Testament doesn't just record some messianic prophecies here and there, but that the whole of it is prophetic. Not just some oracles, but all the narrative is prophetic. He says every biblical story is a prophecy that would be fulfilled <coughs> through all the centuries and in every human soul. <coughs> now notice the prophecy, not just fulfilled um, later on in the Bible and in Jesus and in the church, but also in the human soul. He shows how the Holy Spirit revealed himself in his word in the form of a servant. So he speaks about the servant form of the Spirit, as well as the servant form of Jesus, the Word, and became enfleshed in the Old Testament in anticipation of his incarnation in Jesus, just as our spirits are enfleshed in our bodies. In eight, you have some further thoughts on the course of my life, um, uh, written from the end of after the end of his time in London and completely in Greece. Okay, uh, some before he left London and then uh, the rest when he returned to Riga. And they end on New Year's Day in 15, uh, 1759. And a prayer. So they end in prayer. And uh, then number nine, the last part of the writing, is an undated prayer. Uh, no date is given to the, this comprehensive set of 15 prayers. <coughs> well, they seem to originate from his time in London. They are reworked again and again and used by him in his daily devotion. So we have quite a number of different copies of it, which are slightly different. It is a fitting conclusion to his London writings because they come from a time when he himself learned to pray. Now what's significant here? What's the big change? He believed from his childhood. He was baptized, a faithful attender of the church. But he didn't pray. Uh, that's in his adult life. And then he began to pray again as a result of that awakening. Now the nature of the London writings. On a cursory reading, it's hard to discover uh, any coherence in these nine separate uh, confessional documents <coughs> that make up the London writings. Yet there are two markers which show how they are to be interpreted and how they, are to be, uh, how they are interrelated. The first and most obvious of these markers, so obvious that you can overlook them, are the chronological notes, which relate most of them sequentially to three months in Harman's life. Um, and these are the markers. Thus, after his first intensive engagement in a new way of reading the Bible, on March the 13th, he writes the biblical meditations of a, script, of a Christian. And after that, he pens, uh, and that's from uh, uh, beginning in March the 13th. Um, and he writes these from March the 19th to the 21st. Then he pens the thoughts of my life from 21st to 24th of April and composes his meditation on church hymns from 29th. 6th of May, and he starts work on the fragments the 16th of May, continues his autobiographical journal in 29th. Now that looks just like diary entries, but um, uh, this chronology relates all the data here uh, to his personal and spiritual reorientation over this period of his life all centered around his, that evening of his great awakening. 
Now, um, behind this secular chronology uh, lies a far deeper chronology, um, uh, which shows a parable, a more hidden dimension of its life. It shows the correlation of Harman's reading uh, and writing with significant times in the liturgical calendar. Thus he begins his meditative reading on, of the Bible on Monday after Utica. Utica, the fifth Sunday in Lent. And he starts his biblical meditations on Palm Sunday, and he interrupts the sequence by an extended meditation on the Sermon on the Mount on Monday Thursday. And then he passes over Exodus completely and considers Leviticus, guess on which day? On Good Friday. But then on Friday in the week of Easter, he comes to Deuteronomy and experiences his spiritual awakening on the evening of that day. And then on Saturday, the eve of the fifth Sunday after Easter, he begins his meditations on church hymns. That's the week of Ascension. And then on Ascension Day, he pens a moving meditation on our involvement in the condescension and exaltation of Jesus. Then he comes to write his fragments um, on Tuesday in the week of Pentecost, and continues his work on the journal on Monday after Trinity Sunday. Now, in this way, Harman connects his life once again with the life of the church and the life of Christ. His spiritual reorientation results in the renewal of liturgical piety. That's most evident in his report of his association with the German Lutheran congregation in London and its pastor Pythias and his repeated reflection on Lutheran hymns. He comes home liturgically. Taken as a whole, the London writings are therefore a series of devotional texts, the product of intense meditation <coughs> on God's word and the appropriation of it in ardent prayer. Since a rationalist doesn't meditate on God's word, and a rationalist doesn't pray to God the Father through his son Jesus, they clearly show Harman's transformation from an inter a rational intellectual to orthodox Lutheranism. The inspired word of God and prayer by the power of the Holy Spirit belong together. They are the two main drivers in the composition of these texts. Arrangement and sequence reflect the truth of this. They be, so these texts, texts, if you like, begin with biblical meditation and end with intercessory prayer. They are the poles in that. Okay, let me conclude. Harman's, Harman's intellectual peers fancied that they would be enlightened by the critical exercise of observation and reason. If you like modern terms, critical theory. They imagine through their reason, that through their reason they could overcome the blindness of ignorance and understand all natural and also supernatural phenomena. There's after all was an age of philosophy and science, an age of comprehensive systems, in table uh, that seem to explain everything and encyclopedias that claim to encompass the sum of human knowledge. They were no walls, enlightened by superstitious faith in their sovereign reason, they wanted to be the new seers. That's Hamas, nasty Jared independent thinkers, false prophets. In contrast with them, Harman acknowledges the limits of human reason and knowledge. 
and his, the, his utter dependence on God's revelation. Like Socrates, he prides in his own ignorance and seeks a different kind of enlightenment through God's Word and the Holy Spirit. This is how he describes that kind of prophetic seeing. What is the high regard, what is the origin of the high regard for the arts of divination? And the great number of them which are based on nothing but the misunderstanding of our instinct and natural reason. We are all able to be prophets. All natural phenomena are dreams, visions, riddles, which have their meaning, their secret sense. The Book of Nature and the Book of History are nothing but ciphers, hidden signs, which require the same key that interprets Holy Scripture and is the purpose of its inspiration. What's the key to understanding everything? The Holy Spirit the word of Here Simon refers, Harman refers to the misuse of natural reason by the philosophers of his day rather sarcastically as the practice of divination, fortune telling. The attempt to discover the secrets of the natural world, the occult meaning of uh, natural phenomena so that they could foretell the future. Statistics and gain control of the whole natural world for their benefits. And that's their hidden motive. They want knowledge because knowledge is power and power is control. He regards this as a case of superstitious overreach um, with its abuse of created human powers. It exploits our human calling to be prophets, people who are called to hear God's voice, receive his spirit, and speak his word. That prophetic vocation to which we are all called is abused by people who attempt to become seers by the exercise of natural instinct and reason rather than the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So the key to true enlightenment is the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who has inspired the Scriptures, so that we may be inspired by the Spirit through them and receive enlightenment in the three domains of our human existence. First of all, the Spirit himself interprets his book for us and enlightens us through it, so that we see what God has done, is doing, and what he will do for our salvation. And that same spirit uses <coughs> his book, the Bible, to interpret the book of nature and the book of history so that we see how the triune God is at work in a hidden way in the natural world and in all human affairs. The Holy Spirit, the divine historian, the author of the Bible, the interpreter of the Bible, the author of us as believers, and our interpreter condescends to reveal the counsels, mysteries, and ways of God to people in their own speech, their own history, and in their own ways. He accommodates himself to our all of two human limitations. And that's what makes the Bible so messy and unsystematic. As we read the Bible with faith, the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit produces in us, all the miracles of the Bible occur in our souls, in our lives. Now Simon confesses. I'm convinced that every soul is the stage for the great wonders that are contained in the history of creation and the entire Holy Scripture. The course of life of every Christian is included in the work of God in his covenants with people 
in transgressions, warnings, revelations, miraculous preservations, and so on. For every Christian who has passed from death to sin, the death of sin to new life, can um, die. For every Christian who has passed from the death of sin to new life, can the pre preservation of Jonah, the raising of Lazarus, the healing of the cripple, and so on, be considered as greater miracles. Does our Lord himself not say, which is easier, to forgive sins or take up your bed and walk? Which is greater, physical miracle or goodness? All this depends on the Holy Spirit who reveals the mysteries of God to men through men in human terms. He enlightens his readers through his word and teaches them how to read it. Alan therefore concludes, and I too will conclude. Is not Moses or Isaiah, it is not Moses or Isaiah that has left behind their thoughts and a record of the events of their time as earthly authors and writers for future generations for their people. It is the Holy Spirit who has revealed himself through the mouth and pen of these holy men. The Spirit who hovered over the waters of the young, unformed earth, who overshadowed Mary and acted so that the Holy One would be born, the Spirit who alone is able to search out and discover the depths of the Godhead. This should move us to read the Divine Word with very great reverence and enjoy it too. <laughs> I believe we have time for just a few questions. Does time at all distinguish between orality and literacy? Is he going to church at this time of his, uh, of his meditation? I understand that he would be. And does uh, the orality of hearing the word there impact him uh, in a greater way? Um, you know, uh, it kind of in the fashion of Augustine, who you mentioned, and uh, you know his fascination with Ambrose, um, and uh, reading and not reading the scriptures aloud. Does this make a and, and does he reflect at it, it all on this? Does this uh, sort of impact his thought? Um, yes, that discussion is uh, a fairly recent modern discussion. That would have been self-evident to him, and you can see it's self-evident. Uh, but he uh, doesn't just emphasize the orality of the world, uh, and that's in his understanding, and that's the big shift. He saw the Bible as text for the Bible, and the big change came about when he heard the voice of the Spirit speaking to him through the text of the So it's still, uh, it's both orality and textuality, uh, but um, uh, uh, the thing that he adds is the quality of vision. We read, we listen in order to see. So uh, that's uh, most unfashionable in his day, and is uh, a, a new thing in coming out of Lutheran Orthodoxy. Uh, Wayne Colso, Laban from Illinois. So, um, just two points. Um, did he ever direct his prayer, which was inspired by the Holy Spirit, to the Holy Spirit? Yes. He did. He prays to all three persons. You know, he's all totally three. Trinitarian, so he prays to all three persons of the Trinity. And the other thing is, um, in his humility, did he ever get to the source of of the words of Christ, which promised the revelation through the Holy Spirit. That's right, at the heart of his thinking. Um, one of the most important texts for him is the uh, uh, conclusion of Jesus' teaching in Luke 11 on prayer, which ends, um, no, the disciples ask his teachers to pray, and that culminates how much more 
Will your Father in heaven give his Holy Spirit to those who ask for him? And that the Holy Spirit would reveal more and be the counselor after this. Then what? Be the, he would reveal more wonders than what you see now and be the counselor who the leads presence of into all truth. I mean, that's his whole uh, thing. But not new revelation, but no. le uh, lead us deeper and new deeper friend. and more fully into the mystery of Christ which is only has, only has been revealed on God's side completely in Christ. All the fullness of the deity lives in Jesus bodily. The problem doesn't lie on that side, the problem lies on our side. We only ever have scraps, fragments. We only have glimpses of the full picture. <clears throat> but yet our citizenship is heaven. One of his great things. <laughs> Uh, Mike Holman, Owen, Iowa. Uh, I think uh, there's a, I think Muhammad is a really interesting figure that uh, is similar to, well, he, as you said, he's, he's uh, picks up Luther and speaks Luther to an enlightened audience. And uh, just like Luther talked to Erasmus, and Erasmus was basically, aren't you embarrassed? to say these things about the scriptures and about God. Uh, and uh, that's what I think the Enlightenment uh, critics were saying too about the scriptures. Aren't you embarrassed to um, hold to this Bible? Uh, it's embarrassing book. That's right. And, and uh, today, with what we've talked about uh, this week also, aren't you embarrassed about a God who's wrathful? <coughs> <laughs> and uh, it, uh, one last thing is uh, something I've learned from you, um, a conference that you did on spiritual warfare, where you spoke very, very uh, matter-of-factly about uh, demons and evil spirits and that sort of thing in a way that I've never heard anybody else talk about them. Um, and uh, it was so amazing to me because uh, we don't talk about those things because aren't you embarrassed? Uh, to, to, to talk about such things that people think is ridiculous and superstitious. Yes, um, there's, I, 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 there's no question, but, but I agree with you. On that last part, that's one of his great themes. Um, uh, he sees Genesis 1 um, to 4, let's say, as a prism through which he sees the whole of the Bible and everything subsequent. And one of the uh, passages that he focuses on is the, the so-called uh, Proto-Evangelium, the, uh, 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 he will bruise your heel, you will bruise his, I will, no, not, he doesn't emphasize that, but I will put enmity between <coughs> your seed and the seed of the woman. And so he sees the hidden backdrop of all human history is the battle between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, um, and he uh, and that in the face of these enlightened critics who are totally and utterly embarrassed by angels and demons and most of all by the devil. Interestingly, one of the greatest interpreters of Hartman, who's publicised uh, impossible Oswald Fire, completely overlooks the dimension, as far as I know, of his uh, theology. The chapel bell is ringing and beckoning us, so... <laughs>